nor bedroom slippers nor parallels. The choice of these ready-mades was never dictated by aesthetic delectation. Good afternoon, good afternoon, my fellow citizens of the world. Welcome to the Cabaret Shindig. We are here this afternoon for a ready-made Dada Cabaret. Dada comes from the time after the First World War. Dada was a group of artists looking at the wreckage of war, political upheaval, a rising right wing and a pending economic crisis, and wondering what the point of it all was. Dada will, sadly, perhaps be relevant to a few of us. Dada rejects everything. Dada is freedom. Dada is the lack of meaning. Dada means everything. Dada rejects linear storytelling. It rejects genius. It rejects the logic that led us to war. We are here this afternoon for a ready-made cabaret. Marcel Duchamp, ready-made artist Marcel Duchamp, would take common objects like a wheel or a snow shovel or a urinal and place them in art galleries. He called these the ready-mades and said that they were art because they had been chosen and presented. He wrote that he took an ordinary article of life and placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view. He created a new thought for that object. Art is not creation. Art is selection. Art is a point of view. Today we present to you a ready-made theatrical event, a cabaret. Is this theater? You tell us. Tristan Zara, Dada Tristan Zara, said that to make a Dada poem, you must cut up an article, place the cut up words in a hat, randomly choose one word at a time from the hat, arrange those words in a random order, and voila, you have a Dada poem. And that is how we will be making this ready-made play. We have scenes, and the scenes are parts of stories and narratives, but we are cutting them up and placing them in a virtual hat. And when I prompt you, one of you will come up to the podium and you will roll dice. The number on the dice will determine which scene we do. We will then perform that scene and then someone else will roll the dice and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And we will do dances and songs, Dada dances, Dada songs. And like that, we will make a ready-made play, a ready-made cabaret. The scenes are connected, but it will be your responsibility to make the connections mean something. Ready-made connections, data meaning. Now, we're about to start. I will bring someone up to roll the dice, someone who has raised their hand, data hand at the bottom of your shindig screen. If you'd like to come up, raise your hand. If we don't happen to bring you up this time, keep your hand raised so we can bring you up next time. If you wanna come back up and roll the dice again, Keep your hand raised. We will see you soon. And now, who would like to be first up to roll the dice and choose our first scene? Hello. Hello. Welcome. I like your background light. Purple Thank is you. my favorite color. So if you would... Do you see the lozenge at the bottom left of your screen? It says, roll the dice. Yes. If you would click on that, a dice roller will open up. Choose the number of dice you want to roll, but not more than five. We do only have 27 scenes to choose from. Click roll and then tell us what number comes up. Number seven. Seven. Ooh, first date. Perhaps it is untrue to say that life is a perpetual choice, but it is true that it is impossible to imagine a life deprived of all choice. First date. So we do this experiment. Uh -huh. We take the formula, well, several versions of the formula, actually 17 variations of the formula, some pretty similar, others with pretty significant chemical differences, and we feed them to our different rat populations. How? Huh? How do you just get them to eat it? Oh, you lace it with this chemical. This one, it's really addictive to them. You just add one drop, and that's how you get any of them to. And like, 
any of these experiments. So anyway, Dr. Burton's theory is that it's long been established that human beings are built to create meaning, like literally manufacture meaning. Okay, uh, have you heard of the iPod theory? iPods? Yeah, remember iPods? Like if you had a phone, but just for Spotify? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm all over the place today. Uh, no, no, it's all right. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to keep up. I, I mean, it's fun to try and keep up with you. So anyway, the iPod theory. So uh, this guy from Jersey writes into Apple, <clears throat> you guys, I'm convinced that the shuffle function on my iPod is rigged. What? Yeah. I'm convinced that it vastly prefers Foreigner to any other band. The rate with which, with which it plays Foreigner completely eclipses the frequency in which it appears in my library. And he's got all this data and he sends them lists and lists of thousands of different shuffle results that he's gotten. Look at the percentage that are Foreigner. I get a Foreigner song like one in four, one in three, even though it's only like 4% of my library. Okay. So he blogs about it or writes about it in a magazine. So it's public. And then people start weighing in. Oh my God, my iPod prefers Jimmy Buffett. Well, mine prefers 18th century classical. Hundreds of people weighing in about their iPod's favorite singers. And finally, Apple weighs in. Yeah. No. No? No, it's complete BS, it's random. <sighs> the fact that people are finding predilections with their iPods has nothing to do with the iPods and everything to do with the people. We are programmed to find meaning where there is no meaning. I get it, like us. Huh? Like how we assumed we had to go on our first date because we bumped into each other so many times. Like how we assumed it was like fate. Oh. I hadn't actually, yeah. So anyway, uh, we do the experiment where we get our rats to ingest a pseudopsychotic drug that causes them disproportionate amounts of disassociative symptoms in the hopes that it'll divorce them from this kind of self-idealizing that leads to the search for meaning in humans. And then we kill them and we slice open their brains and we check to see if any variation of the pseudopsychotic has caused shrinking in the sections of the brain that are hypothesized to cause this meaning making. Cool. Cabaret goers, come and join me on the podium. Get ready to roll the dice. Welcome, yeah. welcome. Hi. Hi. On the bottom of your screen, it says roll the dice. Click there. Uh huh. And then choose the number of dice you want to roll. Okay. Click roll. Oh my. 20. 20. 20. Fight. Fight. Our intention is to affirm this life, not to bring order out of chaos, nor to suggest improvements in creation, but simply to wake up to the very life we're living, which is so excellent once one gets one's mind and desires out of its way and lets it act of its own accord. First fight. And the trick with the mouse in that lady's bag? Yeah. Oh, come on, that was awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yup. Yeah, it was funny. Damn. Wow. What? Let me guess, you hated the mind reading one too. I didn't hate any of it. Oh, you didn't like it though? Damn, there's something truly awful about sharing something you like with someone you like and having them not like it. I like how much you liked it. Don't you like to be dazzled? <laughs> What? Just to sit back and be dazzled by something? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> what? Do you want to talk about data again? I guess I just don't find the universe particularly dazzling. Why not? I like how much you... I like... I like that you put 100% of yourself into things. Like, I really, really like that about you. When you watch things, you watch them. And when you like things, you like them. But I'm not, that's not how- You really didn't think the mind reading one was cool? 
You know I'm sick, right? What? I know you've seen me testing my blood sugar. You're just too nice to say anything about it. Oh, is that the... It's not a big deal, the... but I do have to think about it. Like, I would say at any given point, I have some percentage of my attention towards it. It just leaves less to be dazzled by things. I think it takes 100% of yourself to be dazzled by things. I think about other things, too. Okay. My dad is sick. He smoked, and now he has lung cancer. I'm sorry. It's not the type of lung cancer you get from smoking, though. It's some other mm -hmm. random kind. What do you think that means? <laughs> um, probably nothing. Do you think we should break up? Do you want to? I want to move in with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
cabaret goers, who is next? Who will come roll the dice? A group of four with amazing hats. Ah, thank you, thank you. That's much better. So, how are we doing on a number between one and twenty-seven? Seven. Seven. Ah, unblind date. This is fascinating. This order that we're going in. Art is either plagiarism or revolution. Unblind date. Is this a moment we're going to remember forever? There's a lot of factors that go into that. What makes a moment memorable forever? Oh. I have no idea is what I mean to say whether or not this will be that for you. I guess I was asking if a big life event. Sure. Might, I guess I was asking if, if a big life event were about to happen. Do you believe would, in fate? Do I believe? In fate. Um, I've literally never thought about it. Oh. So I guess my answer would be whatever the natural default is for humans. If you haven't spent any additional time pondering the question. Do you believe in this relationship? Do I? Believe in this relationship. Like in the future of this relationship? No, like in the relationship itself. I've also literally never thought about it. So I guess my answer would be whatever the natural default is for humans. I think we should break up. No, 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 <laughs> wait. I think we should get married. Okay. Dada has come up to find and reject the numbers. So cute, oh my God, I can't. I brought my own, hello. Hello, you brought your own dice, fantastic. Well prepared, okay, roll those dice. Oh my God. Now you have to go look for them. Two. Uno, two. Uno, two. Amy does believe in fate. The creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his or her contribution to the creative act. Amy does believe in fate. I'm going to need you to be a little more specific about what you did the night before that. Uh, how much more? A uh, little more specific. Uh, I worked until about seven. I came home. I was hungry. Uh, I considered going out for ramen, but I didn't want to get back in the car. Why not? I, I was running a bit low on gas. I didn't want to burn through it before the morning. Normally, I just get some on my way, but I was worried that if I got back in the car, I wouldn't have enough to make it to the gas station in the morning. You didn't consider picking any up last night? I... No, I get it in the morning. I always get it in the morning. I see. Go on. Uh, I had a lean cuisine in my freezer. I, I made that. I watched TV while I ate Deadliest Catch. Part of my dinner was still frozen, but I ate it anyway. Uh, I fell asleep on the couch, woke up at 1130, took a shower, and got into bed. Thank you. I think that's about it here. Just uh, one more question. Amy, do you believe in fate? Oh. Yes. You do? Yes. May I ask why? Well, because, because I want to be happy. I had a professor in college who used to say that no one had it easier than the Greeks, that they could take literally any amount of suffering. They were so obsessed with fate, so completely enslaved to it, that it was almost like freedom. They just 
accepted abuse after abuse and they were okay with it because they had no choice, right? Fate. Interesting. Now, would you say you have suffered abuse after abuse? Mm, maybe. Somewhat. Yes. Mm. <laughs> what? Oh, do you have any idea how many people have sat in that exact chair? Any idea? And they all, every single one who says they believe in fate, they always follow up with that. That they've suffered abuses, such abuses. The fate has not handled them well. <laughs> I wonder why they believe in her then. Faith? I disagree. I would say ease. Don't you have a judgment to pass? Oh, very well. <clears throat> Amen. I sentence you to a lifetime of unhappiness. What? 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 This is not fair. Please calm down. This is a courtroom. Well, if I had said that I didn't believe in fate, would you have sentenced me to great prosperity and happiness? This is not fair. Then when does fate have anything to do with fairness? Anarchists, come, throw the dice, reject the numbers. I brought my own. Ah, welcome back. Hello. Hello. <laughs> 27. 27, eight minutes. I have noticed that even people who claim everything is predetermined and that we can do nothing to change it, look before they cross the road. Eight minutes. I just realized that if the sun burned out right now, we've just started our last eight minutes of light because it takes eight minutes for a ray of light to travel from the sun to earth. So that means that when we're looking at the sun, we're looking at the future. And when the sun looks at us, it sees the past. Well, what do we do? Um, I guess we look at it. <laughs> Seven minutes left. Well, what do we do when it burns out? I suppose we'll survive for a bit. What are you doing? Appreciating shadows. Hopefully some young intrepid scientist will invent a technology that will keep life going without sunlight. Or what? Or we'll die. No. No? This is stupid. Six minutes left. <laughs> this is stupid. I don't want to do this. Six minutes. No, there's no six minutes. Why? Because there's no six minutes. The sun didn't burn out two minutes ago. I, I like my life. I like my life too. But I don't want... She thinks she has a choice. You don't have a choice. Things happen. Not the sun burning out. Not in six minutes. Five minutes. Four minutes. Three minutes. Stop it! Worried you'll die? Worried you'll decompose? Worried you'll come back as a slug? I'm not coming back as anything. This... This is it. Three minutes. Maybe. No! Maybe. No. You don't know. I, no, I don't, but maybe, but probably. I think when you die, you get to live your life again, a second try to see if you can do better. What will you do better next time? This is my next time. How are you doing so far? Okay. It's different knowing that Every time you do anything, it's your last possible chance to do that thing in that moment. Shut up. Shut the hell up, both of you. I hate this. You always do this, and I hate this. I don't like thinking about this kind of stuff, okay? I don't like thinking about how I'm going to die or the world's going to end or everything that I know and love could be taken away. I, I like what I have. I like how things are, and I feel like when I think about it, like really start to think about it, think about how fucking temporary it all is. I just, I, how do you not go crazy? How are our brains even made to be able to handle that? They're not, they're not, okay? And the only way to survive is to be in denial. So 
I choose denial because I choose survival. I choose survival. One minute. <sighs> Confidence, let the dice whisper to you. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Rolling those dice. Okay. If you run into any issues, let me know, and you can just think of a number between 1 and 27. You can do that. 21. 21. Oh, Hannah is sick. I shouldn't sound so excited about that title. My idea was to choose an object that wouldn't attract me either by its beauty or by its ugliness to find a point of indifference in my looking at it. Hannah is sick. Hey. Hey. Where's Hannah? She's sick. Oh. Was it her fault? Yes. Oh. Ready to go? Yep. Cabaret goers, who is next? Who will roll the dice? <laughs> uh, wait, hello? Hi. Hi, hi, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, are you ready to roll the dice? Just yes, go. let's roll the dice. All right, let's do it. Okay, I got 26. 26? <laughs> Hannah is sick again. Art is either plagiarism or revolution. Hannah is sick again. Hey. Hey. Where's Hannah? She's sick again. Oh. Was it her fault? Not this time. Oh. That's awful. Poor Hannah. Yeah. Probably used up all her luck by now. Yeah. Poor Hannah. Will she be okay? Uh, statistically, yes, except she's probably used up all her luck by now. Right. That's awful. Yeah. Ready to go? Yep. Who is next? Come up. Come up. Roll the dice. Hello. Hi. Hello. Chat. What's in your ready-made drink? It's uh, zero calorie ginger ale, apple juice, raspberries, and blueberries. Ooh, excellent. And I like the flower pot on your hat. Now, if you would do me the favor of rolling the dice, we will yeah, head sure. to our next scene. 22. 22. Other conclusions. It may be that everything we do is determined by some grand unified theory but you would have to be awfully sure that you were destined for the gallows to put to sea in a small boat during a storm. My parents owned a knife sharpening company. We'll come to your house and sharpen your knives. I was never going to be anything but a knife sharpener. And who is next to roll the dice? Well, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I rolled 15. 15. Last fight. Okay. Last fight. I guess I'd never really thought about it. Okay, well, that's not on me. It really doesn't make you uncomfortable? No. None of it? No. Not even the- No, 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 Peter. You know I'm a vegetarian, right? Uh, there's no such thing. 
Excuse me? There's no such thing. As a vegetarian. Right. What? Do I, do I really have to do this? Okay. Your vitamin D contains sheep's wool. Conventional microencapsulation of your organic fish oil uses bovine derived gelatin. Do you know how many field mice and rodents are killed by the machinery that harvests your Bob's Red Mill? You have a dog, Peter. You keep a dog as a pet. And also you ate that burger that one time. When? When did I eat a burger? And for the record, you do know that those cosmetic companies that claim that they don't test on animals can only do that because they wait for another company to test that chemical on animals. And then once it's deemed to be safe, they use it for themselves. Seriously, when did I eat a burger? If you're talking about that 4th of July thing at Maisie's last year, that was a black bean burger, okay? Peter, it really doesn't bother me. Really, really, really. And also, for the record, you do know that the universe tests on us. Someone's up there running a massive trial on all of us. Cancer, autoimmune, viral, every outbreak and epidemic. People like to say the grand experiment, like life is this beautiful, wonderful mystery, but I just hear, yeah, grand experiment, because we're all subjects in the cruelest, most severe double blind you could ever imagine. And no one's life gets run past an IRB beforehand. Here we go. Everyone's out to get Amy. Right, Peter, you wouldn't know anything about that. You just sharpen the knives, you don't use them. Oh, nice, great. Great, Flex. I'm sorry I'm not a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever. We I, all have to die just... eventually, Peter. Okay, even we greater, all Flex. We have to die eventually, and I don't want to have to die of the measles if I don't have to, which I don't, thanks in part to animal testing. I'd rather die in my sleep, old and unaware, rather than slow amputation of all my limbs, followed by blindness, followed by progressive renal failure. Sorry if that makes me some kind of monster. Wait, what? Because of my diabetes. Oh. Yeah, autoimmune diabetes, remember? I thought you said it wasn't a big deal. And you believed me because you're- Stupid? Trusting. Stupid by another name. Shame on me. How did you get it anyway? You never told me. Random? Not because of- Random? I'm not sure I believe in randomness. You don't? Is is that for real? There's more to it than that, I think. But, Peter, the randomness is the more to it. The act of imposing meaning is what creates meaning. It's our... Are you on your phone? Amy. Get off your phone. Amy, my mom texted me. Get off your phone! Do you know what she wrote? When are you and Amy going to get married? Tell me you don't believe in fate. When are you and Amy going to get married? See? I think we should get married. No, no. I think we should break up. Okay. Cabaret goers, come and roll the dice. Hi. Hi. Great. I think you know the drill? Yes. Give us a number. 13. 13. Ah, that is Dada poem. To be a Dada means to oppose all sedimentation. Dada represents the complete absenteeism of what is known as intellect. Dada poem. How to make a Dada poem. Take a newspaper, take some scissors. Choose from this paper an article of the length you want to make your poem. Cut out the article. And next, carefully cut out each of the words that makes up this article and put them in a bag. Shake gently. Next, take out each cutting one after the other. Copy conscientiously in the order in which they left the bag and the poem will resemble you. And there you are, an infinitely original author of charming sensibility, even though unappreciated by the vulgar herd. 
we have a computer program that has created a randomized Dada poem from a section of Tristan Zara's manifesto. Click on the button that says Dada poem and watch your poem dance across your screen. Is the dance action of the determined, enthusiastic, to the faith, out disagreeable of parallel lines? of memory, Dada, intensity, the vigorous abolition, the pure of insects, word to one's church, opposite harmony of disagreeable, enthusiastic sex of comfortable every god. Them with all word means rejected, up of prophets, engaged, ballots, pure with the fists, freedom, bodies, Clash of parallel future accessory to spit. Create the data, every object, the same up tossed folly and two and tossed individuals. Roaring tense moments like a harmony in every of valid data of those impotent. A harmony to create those impotent to the thicket. A luminous that is from knowledge of dance means the future faith in every inconsistencies satisfaction unquestionable faith is the dance of values of those impotent and coddle them coddle them abolition their folly same intensity obscurities apparitions for blood fists the church of every arc Cabaret goers, come roll the dice. Hello, Judy. Welcome. Hi, Welcome. Aaron. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. I am loving your change of hands. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, please click on the little lozenge that says roll the dice. Okay. And I'm rolling. 18. 18. Ooh, why the Greeks had it so easy. I know that all life is a series of infinite chances, which sometimes result one way and sometimes another. Why the Greeks had it so easy. No one had it as easy as the Greeks. I know what you're thinking. Bullshit, right? They lived thousands of years ago. They didn't have any plumbing or vaccines. Most of them were born into abject poverty and died in childhood, childbirth, war, or of some terrible disease. Their lives were, objectively speaking, miserable cesspools of suffering. And yet, those sons of bitches had it pretty damn easy. For three reasons. The Mori, the Fates, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Thanks to these three ladies, every life event of every Greek person was predetermined from the moment of his or her birth. After little Agapetos was born, the Mori spun out the thread of his future life, followed his steps, and directed the consequences of his actions according to the counsels of the gods. If he lived very, very, very well, he could hope that perhaps some major future catastrophe could be averted by a god intervening on his behalf. But for the most part, the events of his life were locked in place the moment that thread was spun. It was done. There was nothing he could do about it. His best bet was to sit back and resign himself to enjoying as much of the ride as possible until starvation or combat or a kick to the head by his goat brought it all to a bloody end. Relief. I know what you're thinking. Because the Greeks believed so wholeheartedly in fate, it roared to life for them, more intricate and psychotically harmonious than you'd ever see it in our day. These things tend to swell to be as big as we'll allow them to be. <clears throat> Oedipus! <clears throat> yeah. Would you explain to the shindig audience exactly what happened to you? Oh. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, gods, it's...
it was awful. It was prophesied from birth that I would kill my father and marry my mother. And my parents, fearing this terrible fate, vowed to send me away as far as they could, so that I might never associate with them, never carry out this horrible curse. However, such things are not inescapable. Would you believe that he killed his father and married his mother? Yeah, I was getting there. That's why he gouged out his eyes. I'm, could you look, like, really look at the world, at yourself after such an act? <laughs> I know you're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but Hear it anyway. This man, Oedipus, had it better than you or I. What? Oh, yes. Or oh, can I object? <clears throat> Depression, anxiety, stress, ah, existential crisis. Ah. These are what we call, my friends, post-Hellenic phenomena. Once you add a free will to the mix, really add it. Add it so fully and completely that it threatens any higher order that would preach fate or predestination. Human beings have a tendency to, well, <laughs> fall to pieces, question everything, spend their lives agonizing, obsessing, living in a kind of existential uncertainty, the likes of which this lucky bastard has never seen. What? Killing your father and having sex with your mother feels pretty bad. Oh, I don't doubt that. <laughs> But for him, it is contained within the safe and secure paddock of fate. <clears throat> Why did you kill your father? It was my fate. Right. Did you know there are people, real people since you, who have done the same thing? Yeah, the gods are cruel. Uh-uh, the gods had nothing to do with it. And those father killers know it. They kill out of fear or anger or desperation not knowing if what they did was right or wrong or even why they did it or if they were justified. There have also been people, real people since you, who have no with their mothers and not because the gods fated them to suffer, but because they chose to do it. Well, who would knowingly choose such a thing? Well, that's what they wonder to themselves every day, even after having made the choice to do it. That's what life is like without the gods. Um, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> I gotta go. Yeah, like, um, I got, um, I got stuff to, to do. <clears throat> He'll never have to look at himself in the mirror and agonize about why. Lucky bastard. Huh. Breakovers, join me, join me. Roll the dice. Hello. Hello. Excellent hat, may I say. Thank you. Now, will you roll the dice and tell me what number you come up with? I got 20. 20. Aleatory composition number two. Now, cabaret goers, to compose this aleatory composition, first choose your instrument. Click on the question mark at the bottom of your screen into the text box, type either cheese grater or coffee percolator. What instrument will you choose? Will it be the cheese grater or the coffee percolator? Don't forget to press submit. Cheese grater, coffee percolator, percolator. And now that you've chosen the instrument, please type an action, strike, bow, pluck, strum, shake or tap and equality loudly or softly. Press submit and await your coffee, coffee caffeinated composition.
go to sleep, even though you're full of caffeine remnants. Greater, I challenge thee to a duel. Who will join me to roll the dice? Oh, we seem to be having some connectivity issues. Oh, nope, there you are. Welcome, welcome. Give me a number between one and 27. Uh, we are having connectivity issues, in which case I will Think of a number between one and 27, eight lab rats. Dada is the truth, the sole practice of a realistic human. Such a person as we see him or her today is in continuous motion, brought about by simultaneity of events, advertisements, the marketplace, sexuality, common possessions, poetics, the economy, without superfluous thoughts that lead nowhere. Lab rats. You guys, I've been thinking. Yeah? I think they're putting something in the yum drink. Oh, they're definitely putting something in the yum drink. It doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make me feel good. It makes me feel. It makes me feel. Like I don't understand things that I, I think I do understand. Like I'm not me. Oh, like pain is good, but. Pain is bad, like hungry is not hungry, but hungry is hungry. We, we don't feel it when the yum drink is late. So um, I, I think it's in the yum drink. It's in the yum drink. I don't like it. I think we need to stop drinking the yum drink. I don't. I, you want? That's not. But uh, yum drink. Do you like how it feels? No. Okay. But yum drink. It's not drinking the yum drink. It's the yum drink. Why can't we stop? How? 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 By not drinking. Don't understand. Gosh, don't drink. How? When it comes, don't drink it. Oh, we can do that. No. No. Why? We drink. We drink. Shouldn't we? Can't we? What about not drinking? Don't understand. Drinking makes us feel not good. Yes. I would think to feel good. Yes. We could not drink. No. Well, I'm not going to. No. I'm not. <laughs> Who would like to roll the dice? It's me. Hi. Hi, how are you? Very well, Welcome. thank you. If you will just roll the dice, tell me the number. I shall do so, let's see. All right, nine. Nine, ah, that is why you shouldn't study the brain. Dada is a state of mind. Dada is a farce of nothingness. Dada is nothing. Why you shouldn't study the brain? Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, I'm here to learn about the brain. 
Oh, you've come to the wrong place, I'm afraid. I thought you were the brain expert. Sadly, you're about a day late. I've decided to change my course of study to something better, something else. Um, so you're not studying the brain anymore? It's too disheartening. Why? The more I study the brain, the more I come up against its limitations. The deeper I dive, the more I see shortcuts. Our brains are the masters of shortcuts. No one takes shortcuts more easily, more effortlessly, more remorselessly than the brain. What do you mean? How many triangles can you count in this image? Everyone, count the number of triangles, click on the question mark, type your answer into the text box and press submit. Um, like eight? Actually, there are no triangles there at all. <laughs> what you are seeing is a shortcut in perception. A shortcut in perception. Instead of allowing ourselves to see what's really there, a collection of lines and blobs, our brain fills in information based on past experiences so that we can perceive familiar shapes. I challenge you to see the strange, interesting shape that's actually there. You I can't. Even when you tell yourself to do it, you can't. And then there's memory. Hmm. Memory, my God. Hmm. I'd like you all to think of your very best memory. The very best, most important memory you have. Okay. Close your eyes. Really do it. The best memory of your entire life. Mm. Tell me, what's your very best memory? Mm, I went on a hike with my mom when I was a child. It was like a perfect day. What day was it? Oh, um, in the summer, so probably June. What did you wear? Oh, um, probably my favorite hiking boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, how was your mother's hair styled? Um, she wore it short by then, I think. And what if I were to tell you that this favorite hike of yours wasn't actually a single hike, but a combination of a dozen different hikes you took with your mother? Seven in June, July, and August of 2004, four between August and September of 2006, and a final one on September 1st, 2007. And that you didn't wear those favorite hiking boots because you didn't buy those until 2010, but that your brain has added them to the memory because you've created this memory and shortcutted it to stand in as a complication of a, a series of a positive occurrences. Your mother's hair was different on most of those hikes, by the way. Did you know that if your brain were a bit more robust, it actually could be hosting 12 wonderful memories for you. Instead, it's completed them down to one, a single travel-sized memory, if you will. Okay. I don't think we hiked in 2004. Like, we couldn't have... Oh, you did. You hadn't moved out the Berkshires yet. Oh. Mm. Real life is infinitely more intricate than our brains allow it to be. I mean, maybe that's for the best. <laughs> maybe. It's too important to us to make sense of things, make them neat. But think of all the shapes we'll never see because of the few that we know. And think of all the days that are lost to the past. Who will join me to roll the dice for our penultimate scene? Welcome back, welcome back. Hi. Lucky sip, and then 24. 24. Ah, Dr. Burton's mad science experiment. There's no such thing as an empty space or an empty time. There's always something to see, something to hear. In fact, try as we may to make a silence, we cannot. Dr. Burton's mad science experiment. <clears throat> I'm thinking of getting a tattoo. It's oh. going to say, 
What good did the theories of the philosophers do us? Did they help us take a single step forward or backward? What is forward? What is backward? Did they alter our forms of contentment? We are. We argue, we dispute, we get excited. The rest is sauce. Sometimes pleasant, sometimes mixed with a limitless boredom. A swamp dotted with tufts of dying shrubs. Oh, that's going to be a very big tattoo. <laughs> hmm? Oh, that's going to have to take up a lot of space to fit that much. Well, they can write it small. Oof, they can't. They can't make it as small as you think they can. Perhaps Tristan Zara demands to be written in large letters. <laughs> All the way down my back, then, spreading as low as my ass. Yeah, perhaps. <sighs> Our search for meaning is killing us, Dr. Pearl. There is no why. There is none. I must free myself from the prison of why. That's not possible. <laughs> My rats have begun exhibiting strange behaviors. The latest formula seems to be working. Hey, you can't say that. You don't even know what working should look like. I look in their eyes and I see something there. Something that I've never seen before. They're rats. <laughs> You're seeing nothing more than rats that are on drugs. No. Dr. Burton. <clears throat> what if I told you that you could drink this? Just... Drink this down, and you'd be able to know what it feels like. Um, what is that? Where do you drink it? Dr. Burton, what what, what feels like? I, what is that? It's what I've been giving to the rats. Hey, you can't take that yourself. It's never been tested. Exciting, isn't it? Dr. Burton, this is your humanity you're talking about here. Everything that you want, it's a part of you. It's what makes you human. Well, haven't you ever wanted to be anything else besides a human? You can't escape that. Not in my body, but... <laughs> we are often told that we are incoherent. But into this word, people try to put an insult that I find it is rather hard for me to fathom. <sighs> Everything is incoherent. The gentleman who decides to take a bath but goes to the movies instead. The one who wants to be quiet but says things that haven't even entered his head yet. There is no logic. The acts of life have no beginning or end. Everything happens in a completely idiotic way. Quoting Zara doesn't make you some kind of genius, Dr. Burton. Well, I don't want to be a genius. I don't want to think about genius, to respect it or disrespect it. I don't want to value it. I don't want to value. I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and wonder what happens to me when I die. Wonder where my mother went after she died. Miss her. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to make a contribution, good or bad. You don't want to be a human being? It's exhausting. Playing a game we can't win. Because there are no winners. Because after all of that, it's not really a game. Okay, there are people. Uh, happy people, content people. They would say that they, that they have won. Well, would you say that? I am not among them. <laughs> <laughs> Those people don't exist. They're just like us. They've just resigned. They're confusing the relief of resignation with happiness. I won't resign, Dr. Pearl. No, okay, it's not going to work. Because you don't even know what it would mean if it did work. Bottoms up. Oh, hey. And now we have our final scene. Cabaret goers, it's time for you to choose the ending. We have an end and we have another end. Would you prefer an end or another end? We have an end or another end. Type into the text box at the bottom of your shindig screen. An end, another end. An end, excellent. I am firmly convinced that all art will become more Dadaistic in the course of time because from Dada proceeds the perpetual urge for its renovation, an end. I got fired. What? I let the rats go. Why? I wanted to. I wanted to watch them scurry around. It was nice for a moment, but I messed up. 
I let them go in the lab. I thought they would be free, but they were in the lab, so they ran, but they were stuck. Because there's no, the lab is very sterile, you see. There are no old nooks or crannies that they could escape into. It's very sleek and modern and minimalistic and everything is chrome and marble. So they ran until they reached one wall and then they turned around and ran until they reached the other wall. And then they just kept going back and forth and back and forth. And then they just stopped, gave up. They just got slower and slower until they stopped in the middle of the room like they knew. And it was no trouble at all for me to just round them back up and put them back in their cages. But Dr. Burton said they'd been compromised. So we had to kill them. Then what? Then I was fired. That's it. That's the end? It's an end. Our play is done. And many of you may be wondering what it all meant. In principle, we're against meaning, as I'm also against principles. We leave it to you to decide what this ready-made cabaret, a collage of scenes, dances, music, and film means to you. A work of art should not be beauty in itself, for beauty is dead. A work of art is never beautiful by decree, objectively, and for all. I oblige no one to follow me, and everybody practices art in their own way. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the show, and please stay for a post-show discussion moderated by Ezra Brain, who is, this is not a theater Hi. company's dramaturg. Ezra is also a playwright, and he will be leading us in the talk back. I know we actually already have a question or two submitted into the uh, text box that goes underneath the question mark there on your shindig uh, panel. But Ezra's gonna start us off, and we will cycle through some questions for actors who will talk about what it's like to do digital performance, how that's different from live performance, et cetera, et cetera. But Ezra, I hand it over to you Absolutely. and uh, to start us off. Absolutely, thank you so much. And first off, I wanna thank everybody uh, in the Shindig Room for coming and also all of our friends who are joining us via the HowlRound live stream. Um, so this is a really uh, exciting piece, I think, to talk about, especially within the context of the brave new world of digital theater <laughs> that we are all through, through want of nothing else embarking on. And Aaron, I was wondering if you could talk about um, sort of, this is not a theater company's history with digital theater and how you came to sort of resurrect this piece, which was a piece that was done IRL uh, a couple of years ago. Right, and now we're <laughs> URL. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is not a theater company creates site specific multi-sensory theater. Um, dance theater, actually, I would argue. Uh, in this case, musical dance theater. Um, and we have actually done, I mean, as you know, Ezra, and as many of you in the audience know, digital theater did not begin with the pandemic. Um, I think the, uh, the pandemic has invited uh, everyone to try their hand at online performance, but for many years there has been multimedia theater, um, uh, 
there have been what um, uh, pod plays, which are site specific audio plays. And this is not a theater company has done a number of those. So that is where you get, you download an audio clip, you take it to a specific site. And while the recording stays the same, the site is always changing. And so you kind of mix this fixed recording with the live ever changing uh, IRL stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've done a number of those and we did one for the bathtub actually during the pandemic. Um, we have them, uh, for those of you in New York, we also have Ferry Play for the Staten Island Ferry. And we have a trilogy of pieces uh, collectively called Subway Plays uh, that you download from the app and take onto the New York City subway system, which I'm not sure I recommend <laughs> at the moment. Um, but play in your bathtub, you can take into your own bathtub so it works for social distancing. And um, you play, there are dances for your fingertips on the surface of the water, et cetera, et cetera. And we came to that, in fact, Marisa, Jonathan, uh, you and I, along with a couple of others who are not with us today, um, uh, came to that really because we were thinking, in March, what are we going to do? What do we? What kinds of theater do we need? What are we going to make? And I just desperately wanted a long, relaxing bath. And I thought, okay, well, let's make a play for the tub. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, in a sense, I would argue that I made that for myself. Um, as we did that, then um, Jenny Lynn Bader, who's another uh, company member, wrote a site-specific piece for Zoom called Guru of Touch, which Lupika and Kara were both in. Uh, and we sent that to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe online. And what is interesting about those pieces is that they have played to thousands of people mm -hmm. in over 30 countries. And so there's something fascinating about this moment that it allows us to connect URL with um, people all around the world. And uh, we also did a piece on Discord, which is a gaming platform. Um, that was a participatory adaptation of a of an IRL play um, that just was people sharing moments of what it felt like to be uh, in the middle of a global pandemic. So we had people from Argentina, China, Nepal, Turkey, India, Canada, the United States, um, Italy, and I can't remember where else. Um, and so, again, we were able to kind of do an international thing because we didn't have to pay for plane fares to have everybody in the same room. The room was online. So I think it has invited us to rethink our ways of working with each other. Mm -hmm. This specific piece to sort of answer the other part of your question. Sorry, I'm being very long winded. I'm going to be uh, shorter winded. Um, this particular piece uh, has always been an investigation of fate, chance, and free will, which is to say, are our lives governed by fate, chance, or free will? And to me, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm every day, all day thinking, if I get COVID, is that, am I, is that fate? Is that because I didn't wear my mask properly? Is that because I should have made a decision to stay inside? Is that because, or is it just chance? I happened to walk past somebody on the street who had COVID and I happened to inhale in that moment, you know? So again, I think some of the themes that are happening uh, in Ready Made Cabaret that always were there, even when we did it in 2015, felt particularly resonant in this moment. Um, and Jesse, maybe you would come up and yeah. I'll begin to hand the baton over to Jesse Bear, the playwright, because she wrote four additional scenes for this version, mm -hmm. um, having to do with illness. Um, and uh, Ezra, if you want, I'll come back and talk about the choice of Shindig as a platform, but Maybe. just, wanna, yeah, why don't you talk about the changes that you made between IRL and URL? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we were both, I, I, well, I was surprised when considering adapting this, or I guess restaging this now online, 
um, how much what we had worked. The mm -hmm. only thing I updated really from the text was iPods. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that doesn't work anymore. We don't use those. Um, <laughs> but this, so I added a line explaining it, but I feel like otherwise as it stood, the the scenes held um, and they held in this very crazy world that we have. The new scenes that I wrote, I think all of which played tonight or this afternoon. Um, Just about, yeah. Well, I think they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Those were first yeah. fight, last fight, Hannah is sick and Hannah is sick again. Yeah. Um, so, so those were all prompted obviously by this sort of overarching issue of sickness that's happening right now. I think personally, I'm really interested in sort of like the hierarchy of illness. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's explored in the Hannah is sick scenes. Like there are certain illnesses that if you get, it's because you're a tragic victim. And then there's others that if you get, uh, society sort of blames you and has decided that certain illnesses are worthy of our pity and love and consideration and care and others really aren't. Um, and I guess for me personally, that comes from, I guess, after this play was written, but before this play was restaged, um, I got sick. I got <laughs> what Amy has. I got diabetes and um, was quite struck by the way that people dealt with me. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, when people learned that I had type one diabetes, I was often given a lot more consideration because there's an understanding that I didn't have a choice. It was an autoimmune disease. Whereas um, when people thought I maybe got type two diabetes, there was less care because there's this understanding that if you got type two diabetes, it's because you did it to yourself. So anyway, there's a lot um, that I think plays nicely with ideas of fate, free will, um, just in terms of, of how we care for each other. Um, and personally, I think we don't really know as a society how to feel about COVID right now. It's like, well, if someone gets COVID, do do we feel bad for them? Do we not? Like if somebody goes to, you know, a certain political rally and doesn't wear a mask and then gets COVID, do we feel not as bad as the person who had an, a medical appointment that they couldn't cancel and that's where they got COVID? And um, I think for me, it's difficult but critical to remind myself constantly through my own experience that um, illness is not hierarchical, nor is it uh, nor should we pass value on illness. Illness it just is. So that was kind of the new exploration or one of the new exp explorations for me. It's amazing. Um, and Jesse, just while we have you up here, can you talk a little bit about like the dramaturgical structure of this play? Because I think even before it was all online, it was kind of wild. And now being online, it's even more sort of experimental. So if I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Definitely. I was, I was thinking about this um, with regards to an article I read many years ago about Disney World, um, <laughs> that really has stuck with me. Um, I read this article about Disney World where the writer was saying the reason that people love Disney World so much is that it gives you everything you need and more. So your imagination mm. when you go to Disney World almost has to do no work. Everything is presented for you. It's like so lush. All, you just sit back and it happens to you. There's like not much more you can imagine in Disney World except the sort of fantasy that you're living with. And that idea has really stuck with me. Um, and I think when I was thinking about this play, it's like I, I considered the question of, well, what if we <laughs> actually give you a little less than you need? So mm -hmm. Disney World is over here. Let's give you sort of this much on the other end of the spectrum and see what you do with it. Let's work out your imagination as opposed to sort of massage it and coddle it and relax it. Not that that's not a valid experience. I think <laughs> it sounds like a lovely experience. <laughs> But um, so I think of the scenes in this play almost as sort of skeleton keys that you as an audience member can decide what doors you want to open them with or not. And depending on the role of the night, it's going to be maybe a little bit easier or harder for you to do that. This show was extremely narrative. The one that we got yeah. to this afternoon. I mean, it was like almost the Disney world of Red <laughs> <laughs> But I think what I really wanted to do in making these scenes is I wanted to make scenes that challenged the viewer to decide what they meant by deciding how hard they wanted to work to make them work mm -hmm. together. And I think my challenge as a writer um, that was helped immensely by sort of the structure of this. I mean, there's there's many scenes in this that I don't participate. Like I didn't write, obviously I didn't write the chance dances. <laughs> you know? So those things helped me a lot, like really sort of help mm -hmm. out the play. But 
I wanted something where you could work really hard and you would be rewarded. You would find connections, you know, okay. somebody mentions rats in one scene and then the rats come back later and there's something gratifying in that. And um, so if you, if you put in that work, I wanted to make scenes that would reward you for it. But I also wanted it to be a valid experience, even if you wanted to watch it really passively and you didn't really want to do any work um, and maybe just appreciate it from a visual perspective or from an oral perspective or from, you know, so, so that was sort of the challenge with these scenes. And I think I got lucky because the cast is so fabulous. So <laughs> it's been satisfying to watch no matter what. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, Aaron, just to go back to you. Um, I think that like, there's a two conversations here is that we've been talking a lot about the sort of theoretical, uh, pieces of this, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of nuts and bolts of like what went into choosing Shindig over Zoom or whatever mm -hmm. else. Absolutely. I, um, again, as you know, like most of us uh, in March, uh, my classes at NYU were canceled. Uh, everything went on to Zoom. Um, and I think I, you know, people started, there was then also a lot of work being put out on the internet, sort of mm -hmm. live or films of formerly live performances, which I loved. I, you know, I got to see some stuff at the National Theater, the Schaubühne, the, you know, Electro Theater mm -hmm. in Moscow. Um, and that was wonderful, but those were films of live performances, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would go to these Zoom performances and I'll be honest, they didn't really do it for me. So I was trying to figure out what is a way that we can keep doing live performance and specifically in the case of our theater company, something interactive, um, uh, something where the audience, it's can't approach it like a capitalist sort of, I paid my money, now tell me what to think, mm -hmm. that the audience really has to do the work to figure out what it's about and what's going on. Um, and uh, so I happened, actually, I went to a college reunion and most of that was on Zoom, but one or two events were on Shindig. And I thought, oh, this <laughs> is actually a really great platform. And if a bunch of, you know, middle-aged non-tech people can make this work, then maybe there's hope that we can get, you know, a quote unquote average audience member, whatever mm -hmm. an average audience. Whatever that means. I don't know what that means, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> but now that I've said it, I'm like, there is no such thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but in other words, somebody can just click a link and get onto the platform and it's not that complicated. Um, what Shindig allows us to do, as you can all see, is um, I then went to ITP camp, uh, which is at NYU. It's a creative coding group of creative coders. And I met some really brilliant, wonderful people. And I thought, haha, this is where creative coding is going to meet theater. And so um, I actually, the guy who did the computer program for the Dada poem, had uh, already done that actually. And I said, Brent, can I, you know, borrow your data <laughs> program? And he said, sure. And um, B, who you saw in eight minutes and lab rats, and I can't remember what else today, um, uh, was also in ITP camp. She did three movies that you didn't get to see today um, because she does a combination, speaking of multimedia, of live performance with video overlay and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting. And another of our collaborators um, created this set, I would say, or this background. And that's another thing that I think Shindig offers that Zoom doesn't. Cool. Now, I will say, because I think it's important to say that Shindig, um, uh, it's been frustrating at times. Um, and I mean, all online platforms are frustrating. And I said to someone, oh, but everything's in beta. And he said, oh, yeah, well, our entire lives are in beta right now, um, <laughs> which fair enough. And I think that you also said um, this is really experimental theater. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not just rehashing the experimental theater that was done by Mabu Mines or Richard mm -hmm. Foreman in 1972. COVID has invited us or forced us to really experiment and mm -hmm. to think, you know, to read, like, what is theater these days? Totally. Um, 
and to rethink our definitions and rethink about the ways we work. And you'll hear more about that in a couple minutes. I would say that, you know, we've had, um, shindig has crashed. We've all been yeah. kicked out. We've all, I would say that, um, it's a platform that needs a lot of bandwidth um, and some patience. Uh, I do think that once we've gotten over that, it's created a great experience for the audience. But I will say publicly that I think there's an aspect of this kind of work that is classist. Um, I'm not going to claim that theater IRL is not classist because <laughs> anyone who's ever tried to pay for a ticket to a Broadway show knows how expensive those tickets are, right? But again, so although our ticket prices are low, to get on to Shindig and have a good experience, you have to have lots of bandwidth and a really good recent computer. Um, so that makes it not available to certain people. Um, and so I think it's different. The access points are different, but mm -hmm. um, they are um, equally complicated. Definitely. I would say. Yeah, to kind of build off this, uh, I think, very interesting discussion of the, like, the way we're having to reimagine things. I wonder if Chris could come join us uh, on the podium to talk a little bit about from uh, an actor's perspective, what the transition to Shindig is and like, what did you learn, I guess? Oh, geez. Uh, well, and also, what does an actor have to do in addition to just acting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get off the podium now, Ezra. Call me if you need me. Amazing, totally. But I'm going to... Pika, maybe you would come up also. So, um... I'm not gonna pull the camera down and like show you my whole setup because I don't want to get anybody like motion sickness. But uh, <laughs> suffice to say, my I have a uh, I've basically had to create like a small soundstage in mm -hmm. our like office room. Um, I have a ring light here. I have a backdrop on a tripod. Uh, there's a microphone right here. There's another computer so I can watch my scene partner. Um, and there's just, you know, you have to, we as actors are, are <laughs> I've learned somewhat spoiled in, in <laughs> that we just get to, you know, we show up, we put on our costume, we, you know, when it's performance ready time, we just walk in and all, all the things are there for us because of the like various wonderful creative teams that are like managing all the props and making sure all the things move and making sure all the lights are and we have to do all those things ourselves mm -hmm. um i have a like a soundboard program in here that i you know send my sound into the headphone jack of my microphone so that i don't have to wire like a five foot long plug to my computer itself i'm you know you have to make sure that your lighting balances in in you know in you have to learn very, very basic. I'm not going to claim that I'm any sort of expert on like <laughs> film production, but you have to learn the basics of like, you have to get your white balance right. You have to make sure that you're not overexposed. And, uh, and we've had various uh, issues throughout this process um, in terms of like, some people have, you know, Apple computers, for instance, they don't really have any sort of software that allows you to manipulate those variables right mm -hmm. so like you don't you don't get to change that stuff yep. it, it has the software built in and it decides how it's gonna light you um and for <laughs> myself and lapika who's who will speak to some of these things herself uh when you are a darker skinned person, uh, it decides that it needs to make things really bright. And, <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden you're like completely washed out and you're, you know, blinding white light coming from you in, in your, your camera. And it's, it, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to change that unless you really dig in and you find out all this stuff. So basically uh, we, as, as the performers have had to, learn how to wear all these different hats obviously mm -hmm. the like most basic entry level version of these things um but a, a, a lot of stuff that happens in other people's jobs behind the scenes for mm -hmm. us has been 
put on us. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very helpful. It, it, it gives us perspective to see what, what all the things that go into our performances, uh, both, you know, filmed mm -hmm. and, and on stage, uh, how much work and effort goes into making those things work just right. Sure. Um, and how hard that is to do yes. by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and to kind of build off what you were saying, I think what's been so fascinating about this process to kind of watch from the outside is that how, as you're saying, it's both partially like film production, but then also like deeply theater and then also its own sort of unique thing where like we have mic issues and then like we have to like do a different scene or like on Friday, Shindig crashed. Yeah, you know, right. I was wondering, Lupika, if you could jump up here, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, to this question. Um, Hi. I'll talk about, I think, <laughs> hey, because I think one of the big limitations about digital theater versus IRL theater or film is how limited your movement is, is that Lupika, you're literally in a box. I am. In, <laughs> I'm, I'm in my sound booth, so the walls end here, and there's a ceiling. <laughs> I'm in a box in a box. <laughs> And so I was wondering, like, how do you, because you have to play a bunch of different characters, how do you, like, differentiate, how do you do that process when you can't, like, you know, change your movement that much? Yeah, so, I mean, like Chris was talking about, we have to um, take on all of these other roles. Yeah. I really relied on our costume designer yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, figuring out uh, sort of what movement um physically was inspired by each of the pieces that she chose. And I'm terrible because I just remembered her name and now I've forgotten it. Um, Ezra, do you remember? I want to give her kudos. Um, uh, I will look it up and then I will come back. Um, thank you, Erin. I just, <laughs> it, and then I forgot Carolina it. Carolina Gutierrez, who did an amazing Perfect. job. Thank and you. by the way, <laughs> costume design happened on Shindig over and then yep. people were sent things from Amazon. So in other words, you, that's the other thing is your costumes <laughs> arrived in the mail. Prop pieces and ring lights and things arrived in the mail. Right, I mean, it's a whole new way of uh, getting stuff. Okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> so yeah, so it was one part like, okay, costumes, that, that'll give a visual cue. But um, for someone uh, like me, I am an actor who builds character from physicality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have done several shows where I play multiple characters, but I always use center of gravity and like literal physical changes, which you can't quite convey. Yeah. And you only see this much of my body. <laughs> so um, we did this workshop with Shelly Wyant, who um, uh, work, teaches with mask drama mm -hmm. to sort of learn about the different ways we can position ourselves and different angles we can use and how this can be like more intimidating than being all the way here um, to, to try to give us more vocabulary to use. Um, and then I sort of realized that if I have my center of gravity change, like Oedipus lives down here, um, it informs my voice and it informs my energy. Um, so even if it's not visual, I think it still conveys something different. Totally. Uh, and then I had a lot of fun with accents because... <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And I think what you were saying about um, that workshop with Shelly was really fascinating because what was really fascinating to watch about it is like the things about like how close you are to the camera. And I think Lupika, you were talking about how you have to do that with different characters, but even for you, Chris, in our tech check today, you got on with Marisa to make sure you were equidistant away from the camera so that right. like the reality wasn't broken, which was really fascinating. Yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. Uh, uh, before I forget, uh, one of the the major things that I took away from that that workshop that Lipika mentioned was uh, not sitting because I had been we'd been rehearsing for like already I think a week or two by the time we had that, uh, and I had mm -hmm. been sitting at my desk the whole time, and the difference between trying to like perform while you're sitting down mm -hmm. versus standing up even just standing in this little you know framed space is huge I, like it changed everything about what I was doing and I think made it a lot better so I really appreciated that work that we did yeah. um and I know B is going to speak to this too like with mm -hmm. the chance dances where we like remembered that even if you can't see it, like it helps for us to remember that we have bodies. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, beyond our, our little boxes. The, the thing that I will leave with uh, 
in regards to like suddenly having this stuff. Um, the the we had been rehearsing the lab rat scene just as people, and then we got the masks, and it was mm -hmm. I cannot explain to you the first time we all put the masks on and did the scene together, just those high pitched voices just popped out of all of us. <laughs> and we had not rehearsed it like that. We hadn't talked about it. It just happened. And we're like, okay, I guess that's what they sound like now. <laughs> <laughs> it was delightful to watch that discovery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I popped up just to give a compliment to the cast. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and to thank Shelly Wyant for coming in because one of the things that drives me crazy as a director uh, is just watching everybody act in these boxes. And it's one of the reasons I'm a little done with most Zoom theater productions. And as Lapika said, Shelly was talking to us about, you know, different entrances and things and right. And, different um, positions and directionalities and all of that. And it, I mean, that became the blocking. Yeah. And it, it is for me a much more interesting show to watch because of what all of you have done to sort of challenge yourselves to go beyond what many people are doing with these boxes, which is just sort of going like, okay, this is a limitation, I'm gonna accept it. And all of you have just said, well, this is a lim limitation, let's see how we can push past <laughs> it. Um, and so, and it was hard work, I think, for the actors, right? And yeah, you all did an yeah. amazing job. Yeah, to speak to what Chris was talking about before very briefly, and then I will leave and let someone else talk, um, <laughs> that so much of our rehearsal process was technical learning mm -hmm. platform and figuring out our own tech that it was almost like the character development part had to get left to the end because we needed to understand what we were doing before we could really like get specific and hone in so like yeah we didn't work with Shelly until like the second or maybe even almost the beginning of the third yeah. rehearsal mm -hmm. um and as soon as that happened it was like oh right I remember how to act now like I <laughs> Oh yeah, that's what my job is. Um, I'm not just saying words. I yeah, have to be someone and clicking the button <laughs> and making sure I click the correct podium. Like it, it, it yeah. remembered the like creative artistry of it um, as well. So yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of challenges. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. I was wondering Thank if you. Tara and Marisa could jump up here and talk a little bit more um, about from the actor's point of view. I'll wait for. Hi. Um, ah, there Hello. you go. So I was wondering if you guys could talk about, both of you have done uh, a lot of digital theater and I know Marisa, you've done at least one audio play uh, for This Is Not A Theater Company. I was wondering if you guys could talk about how is this different from the other, you know, doing a play on Zoom or doing an audio play or the all the other digital theater work kind of experimenting with? Um, yeah, so, you know, Shindig is definitely a more complex platform, but there are elements of it that I really enjoyed learning and working with. I think it really allows the artist and the audience member um, to decide for themselves uh, different levels of connectivity that they mm -hmm. want to engage in. You know, we have the pods, we have the feature in which you can mute, um, you can put the mute on or mute off. Um, and Speaking from my perspective as a performer using the Shindig platform, um, there were moments when, you know, I needed a second of a, a minute of solace, so I would, you know, press mute, and that allowed me to be kind of like in my own space to be able to breathe, to collect my thoughts. And when I wanted to be more connected, then I could take off the mute. Um, it be using the Shindig platform did make me feel. Um, closer to being in the theater than working mm -hmm. with Zoom did. Because, you know, when you're getting ready to go on stage or you have a couple of scenes before you and you're kind of like behind, you know, you're you're in the wings, you can see everything that's going on, you can hear everything that's going on and there's that adrenaline. And today, um, today we chose, or a, a couple of us chose to, you know, actively 
watch, be an audience member and watch every scene that was going mm-hmm. on that we weren't part of. And it felt that same way, that adrenaline of, okay, I'm, I'm watching them, I'm listening to them, mm-hmm. I'm seeing the energy that they're exchanging amongst each other. And it's, it's, it's feeding me, it's making me more excited to, you know, go up. And um, that was very fun. Um, I think the, the way in which this, the unique um, construction of this play um, it really causes the artists to sharpen their skills and adapt and, you know, raise themselves to the next level. Because I think that, you know, as people, um, we, I think our brains like routine. Mm-hmm. And with this play, you can never get used to a chronological order because there is no chronological order. So, um, from my perspective, there was always that there was always like a little bit in, a, of anxiety, the butterflies in the mm-hmm. stomach thinking, OK, what scene is going to be next? Um, mentally, uh, mentally transitioning myself to, to scan in my head, you know, OK, I could be possibly doing this scene. So I need to put on this outfit or I need to put on these pair of glasses. And then along with that, um, being aware that of the well, first learning the, sh- the shindig, learning the platform, seeing how quickly it takes to get onto the platform and off of the platform. So you all always wanna make sure that when you get on, you have your costume on and you're not like on screen fixing your costume oh. or, or, or being in the scene and not knowing exactly when you're going to be taken down. So you don't wanna be changing costumes when the scene has ended because that's going to shift the audience, you know, it's going to take the audience out of the imaginary world. So it's very complex and it's working with this play and working with this new platform is very complex, but I find that it has helped me gain a new skill as an artist. And I feel like I'm ready to tackle something new. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And I think in terms of your question of like audio play, Zoom play, Shindig play, I think that in an audio play, I mean, you, the person who puts the show together, unless it's a live performance, which I haven't experienced in terms of like an audio play, um, you just, I recorded it in a closet. Like I wrote a monologue, I recorded it in my closet and I sent it to Erin and she put it in the <laughs> you know? So there's that. Um, and you know, she sends direction over email mm-hmm. and then you re-record it and then you send it again. So you kind of have that collaboration, but it's not as much. Yeah. And then with the Zoom play, there isn't um, a lot of control in terms of tech and the actors. Cause like you can turn off your video, you can add a virtual background, you can, you know, unmute yourself, mute yourself, but you can't, in terms of blocking, it's very limited because you don't know where you're gonna end up in terms of the boxes. Yep. Uh, the Zoom decides that for you. So like. <laughs> You really can only pretend, depending on we know whatever the director you wants, but if you want to have like seem like you're speaking to somebody, you really can just like look into the camera and pretend that the camera is your scene partner so that maybe they can experience it that way. Um, whereas with Shindig, there's really a lot of freedom for blocking um, mm-hmm. and, ter- and in terms of like movement, because we discovered that if we look like right over here, I have a screen up here, my iPad, I can actually look at my scene partner and react to their physicality instead of just their voice. Whereas with like mm-hmm. Zoom, you can't really look at the screen. I'm just reacting yeah. purely on vocal cues. Um, so that's the difference. And yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, amazing. Uh, Kara, what you said was really interesting to me that this feels more like theater because mm-hmm. I totally agree is that I think, maybe I can speak to this too, but I found the sort of three months of Zoom plays that we all did to be really, <laughs> like disorienting because it's like you're kind of with people but kind of not with people versus here like with the pods like I see a couple people pod up right now that you can go and like Marisa you and I often were like kiki before the beginning of the show while other people are like tech checking or whatever and it feels like a rehearsal room where it's like you got that energy in the same ways that you come in as an audience member and you can go up and talk to somebody or or stay by yourself which I think is this is the closest I think digital theater has come to replicating the live theater experience at least for me. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, I I saw a few, I, I did por- perform in a few Zoom plays, but I also saw a few uh, prior to performing. And it was very difficult for me to get into it because, yeah, it, it, 
it was very difficult. And I think what Marisa was speaking about in terms of being able to set up a screen and being able to react off of, you know, your scene partners movements and things like that. I think that that really definitely helped bring um, this piece alive um, with the addition of shindig allowing, you know, there to be podiums to be able to, uh, to select, you know, select direction and everything like that. And I think that definitely has elevated um, virtual theater to another level. And I think it will possibly force Zoom maybe to, you know. <laughs> step their game up a little bit, yeah. Yeah, step their game up, definitely. And I look forward to seeing more um, plays on Shindig on this platform. Amazing. Yeah, I think the only thing left to figure out in terms of live performance is like, you know, with Jonathan with the aleatory compositions, which he'll get into, and I'm sure we're gonna speak about, is like syncing up music and mm -hmm. like singing maybe, or like instrumental, like playing yeah. together. I think that that is not, I have no idea where that, when that will come. And I look forward to see if somebody can figure it out. Cause that's something that like, I think no online platform has figured mm -hmm. out yet. And I'm really excited to see what will happen there. Absolutely. Um, on that note, thank you guys so much. I wonder if uh, Jonathan and B could come join us to talk about what I think is the sort of craziest part of this whole uh, show, which is the aleatory compositions and the uh, chance dances, which are things that when I first, uh, when Aaron first approached me about this gig, I was like, there's no way we'll be able to do this online. And so I was wondering if you guys could talk about like how, like what goes into doing improvised dance and music on a digital platform. Sure. Um, I guess I can go first. I'm actually, so I, I brought my hat as proof. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm actually the second dancer in this show, um, and uh, didn't perform t for the show. Chance, chance arranged things differently. Um, but yeah, I I want to just go back to Lapika mentioned the workshop that we did with Shelley, which was so helpful in determining how to relate to this box and to find the edges to play with distance. And of course, you know, like we, Jonathan and I get extra distance, you know, to play around and, and enter and exit um, our respective squares. And so um, that is something that's very interesting to me also because I am a filmmaker, as Aaron mentioned. Um, I also made some ready-made films for the show and um, I've done some dance film um, as well, um, not for the show, but separately. Um, and I find that this this platform is some it's somewhere between like the live performance experience and the creating a dance film mm -hmm. experience because mm -hmm. in in so far of the live experience there's the improvisation there's the making the choices in the moment there's engaging with an active audience it's giving us prompts it's very in the moment it's very live it's very exciting um, and we get to see each other you know when we in our duet dance that we have chance dance number three. Um, but it's also like dance for film because we're relating to a camera and we're determining what body part gets visible at what time. What's different to um, dance for camera where you have the camera and you're making choices of where the camera gets to go and what it gets to emphasize. And here we have to physically move our bodies to relate to a stationary camera, mm -hmm. which is a, a different kind of interaction. And so I know as a performer, I have so many things going in my head while I'm performing, where I'm trying to read the prompt of, mm -hmm. you know, what did the audience member just ask me to do? What does that mean to me? How do I do it? And then I'm also thinking about where am I in relation to the camera? Um, have I done a lot of things in the background? Do I need to start doing things more in the camera? Have they seen a lot of my face, even if they're asking for a different body part? You know, how can I mm -hmm. experiment and give a little bit more variety? Um, in my performance. And so there's a lot of things that I'm negotiating and thinking about in in choreographing, you know, in totally. real time um, in collaboration with the audience um, as a dancer. Um, and then just one more thing I wanted to talk about, which is um, I have a lot of fun in the show because I get to feel the full range mm -hmm. of chance, the, the continuum between chance and ready-made. Um, mm -hmm. Because as a chance dancer, that's like a completely chance experience, you know, like so, I obviously have my own physical biases and I make choices a certain way as me, but the choreography or, you know, the choreography improvisation is determined by chance by the audience. So that's a total mm -hmm. chance experience and improvisation experience. 
And then on the very other end of the spectrum, I created three ready-made films, which are completely finished and complete packages that are done. And they just get popped up as a scene or not, depending on the roll mm -hmm. of the dice. Um, and so that's the like completely predetermined part. And then kind of living in the middle ground is the performing as an actress or actor, because um, I play Hannah and one of the rats um, in the show. And that is, while it is a predetermined script and we've run it and we have kind of ideas of like how we're gonna play off of each other and what the meaning is and all of that, um, with all live performance, every performance is a little bit different and it has a little bit different tone to it and the way that we interact and also depending on what scenes it's couched between, Absolutely. might have a different kind of narrative meaning. So I've I've had a lot of fun kind of straddling these different mm -hmm. worlds in one one experience. Um, and I think, um, yeah, dramaturgically, it's like really fun to do this theatrical experience and Shindig is holding space for it so well. Um, and in such a new and interesting way. And I'm excited to, as Marisa was saying, excited to see what new technologies and new virtual theater possibilities come out of this time because we've all as artists had to innovate in a new way. Um, so I'll leave it there and pass it to Jonathan to talk about yeah. Aleatory, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that this flow of conversation has been so wonderful because you sort of hear from the perspective of all the different jobs you might have in this, I think B really does encapsulate that full spectrum. And whereas I am now going to speak from only dealing with the random craziness. <laughs> and um, so in regards to the composition specifically, which we we got one today. <laughs> um, oh. Hello? No, I'm just joining you. I'm just joining you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, um, but, you know, as a timekeeper, I would say, Ezra, let's let Jonathan talk and then move on right. to the, yeah. Okay, okay. gladly. Um, but, so yeah. what, what I'm most thinking about today is uh, in terms of the compositions and is about interactivity in general mm -hmm. with this platform and online and how online you really do, I hate to admit it, you have so much heightened possibility to really work together more immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it also brings up, you know, how our behavior changes both as performers and audience members when we sort of lose our body and then sort of become connected in this different yeah. way. So something, I do a lot of participatory stuff. This is not a theater company, does a lot of participatory stuff. And something that I've noticed is that, you know, online, we are physically farther apart but we're so much closer in terms of communication. Mm -hmm. And when we're in person, I've, I, I really love the, the court jester thing was, was really great for me because I often feel like that. And I love to take requests as a performer, but I find that in person, if I approach a group and I say, give me a note and let me run with it, there's a lot more like, what? Okay, mm -hmm. let me go to the bathroom break and think about that. You know, I, there's something about <laughs> being here that, and I think we experience this in our like Facebook rants and in how we use social media and everything that that we feel a bit more empowered and emboldened mm -hmm. to um, to give information a bit more immediately, and um, and. And it really, I thinking about like the Zoom versus the shindig, I really have come to feel like a shindig body in terms of what positioning and orientation of myself makes most sense for this and the little gadgets that are possible. And, and I, you know, I, I would knock things down if I showed you my array of instruments <laughs> on the uh, counter, but I really do try to lay them out like it and at an arm's reach at any moment because of this immediacy that um, you wouldn't otherwise get in person. Um, and so as a performer who I, I identify as a bit more analog by preference, you really, I've, I've been fascinated by what does and doesn't work on here. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, one of the biggest things from John Cage's ideology is, is the silence and the impossibility of silence, but using silence as an invitation to notice the sound that is always there. And and I think because there is, we are together, but there is the gap between mm -hmm. us when we are together online that 
silence and stillness doesn't really work, unfortunately, mm -hmm. on here. And um, so, because it can so often be construed as a mistake or that the internet is breaking. Mm -hmm. And so, so there actually is on here, whereas in person, I would actually be a lot more comfortable with like people take, taking their time to give me a request. There's actually this sense of like, let's move it along, let's move it along, let's keep it going, let's see. And, um, and so because of that, because I'm getting discreet requests, mm -hmm. And I really love the question feature on here because it just puts it right up there so you can respond pretty immediately. But if you're not getting anything right away, that's sort of the fun place for me because I can't be still or silent. So I have to figure out how to keep something going or morph what I was doing before into the next thing, which is sort of where I get the most uh, artistic license. Okay. And... Um, and then we have to think about this in terms of how we structure it on here too, where, you know, we went, Aaron and I went through a lot of drafts of how to do these participatory rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we started off with a lot of rules and a lot of options because they're fun. And again, in person, when you have time and space, you can dwell on that. But here again, the dead space really feels dead. So, and, th and information becomes, it's more in your face, it's more immediate, but it also becomes more overwhelming. <laughs> So we found that by really being okay with like, okay, it's just A, B, and C yeah. as the ingredients. It's enough to really get people motivated to offer suggestions mm -hmm. and really actually much more easy for me or B to take it and roll with it. Yeah, originally we had a chance dance that also was going to bring in a whole array of props. And there was a lot of things. It was really fun to play with in rehearsal, but we realized pretty quickly that it would be a lot for the audience and for ourselves to pull off in this platform. Yeah. The last kind of point I want to make is um, kind of ties back to our dramaturgical structure a bit. Something I like to think a lot about, um, you know, I'm, I consider myself folk fluxus because I really, I really love this this madness, but I also really love traditional um, mm -hmm. forms. And what what is really interesting to me in any artistic form that is a bit more composed is that there's usually something that's left to chance, whether it's in how you do a technique, you focus on this and then something else will happen as a result of it, or there's something in a performance practice where it's like, we'll be strict here. And then this is a little more open. Mm -hmm. So I, I really become quite a nerd about like, oh, look, there's a bit of cage in this, or there's a bit of Zen in that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then here, you know, we're doing this piece all about that. And so the whole notion flips where we actually need this system, this, um, software to work. Yeah. Right. And, um, but still there's these wonderful middle moments where where like today there was a bit of a delay in the video and like, eh, this is where we are. And thankfully the whole internet didn't crash and burn. We were able to get it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it really reminds me how like this, Shindig, Zoom, these mm -hmm. other, none of them are made with theater in mind. No. We, they are lit, we are using them as ready right. made. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Theater. You know, so Shindig, you know, it's podiums, it's conferences, but we're using mm -hmm. it as theater. So we're, we're duchamping the internet. Excellent. Yeah. Or hacking to use the computer term. But yeah, you're right. In other words, yeah, the ready made space, the ready made system, and we've gone in and changed it. Ezra, I'm going to get at down so you can bring the Amazing. state managers up. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Um, so I think uh, to kind of go to transition from Jonathan's point about like dead space and like really needing to like be on the ball. I wonder if we could grab our amazing stage management team up here who are first the absolute best in the business, best I've ever worked with in my entire life. Uh, hey, Bradley. Oh, stop. Um, hey, Randy. <laughs> um, but can you guys talk about like all the crazy madness, hey, Kelly, that goes into like making this show happen? Yeah, thanks, Ezra. Hi, everyone. I'm Evangeline. I'm the stage manager. Uh, to my screen right is Bradley, who is one of the assistant stage managers, and Kelly, who is the other stage uh, assistant stage manager. Um, but really, for this show, the the terminology of stage manager, assistant stage manager, um, 
uh, it, we are really challenging uh, what that means in, in this medium. And um, uh, the way that, that we really run this process is really with what I would, what I would call uh, two calling stage managers, which are myself and Kelly, uh, and then one deck stage manager, which is the role that Bradley takes on. Um, and yes, it really does take three of us to run um, to run this show. It's it's interesting. You you know when sort of virtual theater was developing back in March, April, May, and people were trying to think about what the fall might look like in this world. You know, I, I remember being in a conversation with someone where we were like, no, actually, I, I think it's going to take more stage managers to do virtual work than fewer stage managers. And um, and it really does take all three of us to, to run this. Um, and so essentially what we're doing is Kelly and I are, are in control of getting actors on and off stage or the podiums. Uh, getting Aaron on and off stage or the podiums, publishing the questions that come up as people are uh, putting, or not questions, the, the prompts that come up as people are inputting them for Jonathan and and B and the Dada poem. Um, uh, so we really control that flow and we have a, a system in place that on occasion we have to kind of be ready to do each other's roles based on how quickly we regain admin control and um, uh, all of that. One of the the interesting features <laughs> of Shindig that is great for the corporate world, uh, but not so great for us is that only one admin can have control of the functions at, at one time. So Kelly and I have to be in kind of constant communication about who has that control. Um, and then Bradley is essentially backstage with all of the actors, um, checking in with them, available to them as as any if there's any tech issues that come up, and sort of very similar function to what a, an on deck stage manager would do, uh, IRL as it were. Um, and so we we do all of that. Um, if you if you follow this is not a theater company on Instagram, you can see all of these backstage setup photos, and you'll see mine, which uh, sort of looks like a mission control center <laughs> out of a, a movie. I have my laptop. I have an external monitor that I can pull things over where they're bigger. I have a backup laptop just in case something happens. I have my iPad where we have our cast chat running. And then Kelly and Bradley and I are all on an app called Discord that we essentially use as our comm. And so during the show, we have one headphone that's plugged into our laptops on Shindig, and then our earbuds that are on Discord. Um, and so we're sort of in constant stream of communication that way. So there's sort of three communication hubs going at all times. There's the show itself, there's the communication on Discord, and then there's the communication on WhatsApp um, with the cast and with Aaron. Um, so it's been a really interesting um, just new way of working, but also utilizing all of what we what we do in general as stage managers. I also just have to point out that when you work at a university theater department and you say that you want to put up Christmas decorations in your office, you end up with an entire set. So <laughs> me behind me right now. Um, I'm going to turn things to Bradley for a moment. Mm -hmm. This is going to address in a little more detail that communication system. For sure. Um, I know for me, being being a stage manager, especially being like a deck stage manager and assistant stage manager, a lot of what I was used to when it comes to communication is, oh, if there's a problem, let me walk right over to this other person that's just a physical distance away from me. And rather than having to track them down or having to calm them down, we'll have this conversation and have this discussion. A lot of what goes on, I know what I really struggled with at first was having all these conversations, these important conversations and important moments happening in two ear canals all at once. <laughs> so rather than having the luxury of like, okay, Evangeline's talking to me here, Kelly's talking to me here, Erin's talking to me here, Esther's talking to me here, and being able to comprehend all the conversations at once, it's one. So, <laughs> What I found like really cool about kind of entering the virtual world that I never really thought that I would like 
come like face to face with is this idea of like all of these apps and all of these different ways and modems of communication and of being able to take them and like because all like whenever you're like I know before the pandemic and everything happened there were all these things like oh download everything on onto an iPad and it's like yeah, I can take 45 minutes to try and learn these things, or I can just write it down on a piece of paper and go from there. <laughs> it really kind of faced and challenged us with this idea of like having these Google Drives and having these documents that we could all work in and all be able to communicate with each other. And then for the most part, that's been kind of like the roadblock that's been very fun and like innovative to discover is all of these like potential things that we can use and utilize that can connect us all together. So that rather than working individually, we're still that unit. Mm -hmm. I think that's been like, what's like super comforting, comforting throughout most of this is that even though the only person I had worked with prior to this was Kelly, who Kelly, I'll, I'll pass this off to Kelly in a second and she'll talk much more in detail about it. But Kelly was the only person I knew on these teams. I had never met Evangeline before other than like, in like, a, in like a friendly, like, like, like grab a drink, get to know each other setting. So to be able to kind of create these authentic connections mm -hmm. through the virtual medium was something that I really had a great time doing and really discovering and falling into. And then I'll pass it over to Kelly and Kelly will be able to go a little bit more in depth. Yes. I'll also publish Ali's question here because it has to do with what we're talking about. But um, yeah, so it's been fun trying to like, you don't know how it's going to work online, how you're going to get that community feeling with your teams. That's always like a big part of a show. You're always like best friends by the end. And so it's always so exciting. And so it's been really fun on Zoom to do our like little Zoom dates or as you can see, we're like tripleting here on flannel shirt, like stuff like that it just helps us all to be come together and like Bradley's in the city. I'm on Long Island, Evangelist in St. Louis. So like even that we're so far apart, all these technologies and this virtual world we're in is helping us become more of a team and we all have that family bonding and we talk during the shows and stuff so yeah yeah well like the just the discord chat is one of my favorite things in the whole world yeah. it's like it's really cool too because a lot of the times when you're working backstage um the only person who has an open comm is the calling stage manager that is like one of the only people that like you hear their comm at all times because usually typically when you're on deck you're Come out to be quiet, or else it'll, it'll re echo into theirs. So, to have a Discord chat of all, like having an open comm from all of us, has been so nice. We just have these like lovely conversations about like what's going on. Audience members we love, audience members that make us laugh, just like different things going on that we just are like, oh, this is my favorite scene. This is my favorite scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will just close us um, by saying uh, that in addition to what Kelly's saying about creating community here, as stage managers, all three of us are really, it's really important to us to create that community within the company as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've tried to do fun things like playing music for Saturday Night on Shindig and, um, you know, coming to a, a morning performance with our favorite coffee mug and, and things like that. Um, so it's been a really great experience all around. Um, also, Kelly is one of my former students. And so it's wonderful to be able to work with her on this process uh, as well. So yeah, that's that's us. And thanks, Ezra, for, Thank you so much. for having us here. Amazing. Erin, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything to kind of close this out. Um, Oh, I guess I'm back. But if, Bye. if, you, hey. um, but Aaron, if you don't have anything, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, everyone for coming. Um, we have one more show tonight. Uh, and then, uh, uh, as Evangeline mentioned, on our Instagram, we're showing everyone's backstage and we'll be keeping you up to date about all the different fun digital and hopefully at some point IRL theater we do in the uh, future. Right. And um, you can see some of our other digital work if you go to www.thisisnotatheatercompany.com. I just wanted to thank Hal Round one more time for hosting us on their street for you know, their live streaming platform. And to note that there will be other articles and other shows that Hal Round will do that will kind of archive um, or examine this moment when artists are really having to uh, pivot and reinvent what they're doing and the forms in which they're doing it. And I think it's um, wonderful of HowlRound to support all of this really interesting creative work. And Ezra, I just want to thank you for being an amazing moderator. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Uh, thank you so much for Bye, coming. Bye, everyone. Again.